Let's talk about requirement number three, protect store data. It's not just about data security in your database, although it also is about data security with strong encryption, key management, key life cycle, and so on. But it includes other topics, such as, for example, not storing data that you don't need to store in the first place, or purging data that you don't need anymore. Or, for example, never ever storing sensitive authentication data. But there are other topics that we must comply with. Let's take a look. Requirement 3, with the official name of Protect Store Cardholder Data, is very straightforward. And it's all about making sure that your stored cardholder data is properly protected. It's about both making sure that the encryption used is strong by nature, but that it's also properly managed itself. For example, with proper key management and key lifecycle. It's also about protecting the personal account number stored. Remember, stored data are not just digital data. They're also receipts on paper, logs on paper, or any other medium that contains cardholder data. Sub-requirements of requirement 3 include, first, limiting the storage and retention of card data to the essential. The most secure way to store data is to never have to store it in the first place. Then, not storing sensitive authentication data, such as the CVV number or the PIN, period. Then, 3.3 is about masking stored personal account numbers. Usually, you can show the first six, also known as the BIN number or bank identification number, because these are related to the bank that issued that card, as well as the last four. Everything else in the middle that's hidden is the unique part. If you've ever obtained a receipt, for example, at the restaurant, and the credit card number is shown, but you just see a lot of asterisks in the middle, and you see the first six digits and the last four, this is PCI DSS at play. Then, 3.4 is rendering the personal account numbers unreadable on all communication channels, encrypting it, masking it, etc. Just making sure that if an attacker intercepts your communication, they can't read the numbers. 3.5 is about procedures for key protection, the keys used to encrypt the card data. And 3.6 is about procedures to manage those keys, the crypto period, having a key custodian, maybe split knowledge, and so on. And finally, 3.7 is the customary document and enforce all of these policies and procedures. So all of these points must not be done informally, but instead with written down policies that are put into practice. So first comes requirement 3.1. Cardholder data must be limited in terms of what is stored and what is retained. And note that this process covers both logical and physical cardholder data. So both databases, but also paper receipts or copies that contain card numbers. And it also covers for how long it may be kept and how it's disposed of. So first, you need a data retention policy. What data are kept and for how long? And this must be what happens in reality. It's not worth it to have a policy that says you store numbers for 30 days if in practice they're in the database for years. Which is why you also need to clarify how the deletion is done. So printed data can be shred or burned, and digital data, such as hard drives, can be securely deleted by zeroing out the deleted data, or in the case of physical destruction, they can be demagnetized, shredded, or others. But the key here is use common sense, have a procedure, and this policy must be frequently reviewed, at least quarterly. As with many other things, this is because technology changes, your infrastructure changes, and your data retention policy needs to keep up with those. 3.2 is very simple. No storing sensitive authentication data, period. Remember, what's usually on the back of the card, such as the CVV code, or the magnetic track, or the PIN number, should never be stored. It's not needed. 
It can be transmitted naturally, but it is immediately deleted afterwards. You will notice that with a retailer like Amazon, when you add your credit card number, it asks you for the number and expiration date, but it doesn't ask you for the CVV. And then when you go to pay, it asks you for the CVV in real time. And like the rest of the data, sensitive authentication data are never stored, just used in the moment. But now here's the key. You can't just say that you don't store it. You have to prove that you don't. The responsibility is on you. So by default, you fail and you have to prove that you pass. And you do this by assessing all possible points in your card data process where you could acquire sensitive authentication data and proving that you don't store it at any of those points. So you have to show the assessor this is where we store the card data in our website. And please note that we don't store it here. Now, here's the part of the flow where they pay, and they input the SAD. And we also don't store it at this juncture. And you have to do that for every possible point. And this includes storing it in the database, possibly showing it in digital media, printing it, or any other medium. You have to prove that for every situation where you could store this data, that you don't store it. Sub-requirement 3.3 is about masking the stored personal account numbers. Again, first six digits and last four. So you need to inventory all users that could access cardholder data and gauge what every single one of them sees. You usually don't do this by individual user, but by roles, but you still need to do it. We will cover this in more detail in requirement seven about need to know access, but there is a principle that's shared here, which is the POLP, the principle of least privilege. Whatever data the person needs to see to do their job should be the least data possible. So for any individual that does not need to see the full card number, the personal account number, and this is most people, by the way, they must only see the first six digits plus the last four digits. So call center support people, people who operate the POS, and many others. In many organizations, this will actually be every single person except the database admin. And the data can even be encrypted in the database, so even them may not see the full card numbers. Then, 3.4 is about rendering the personal account numbers and readable on all communication channels. This is in case an attacker intercepts your communication. For example, they intercept an email from an employee who performed the payment who is communicating a card number to their superior. In these cases, the card data must be unreadable, and there are a myriad means to perform this. You can encrypt it as well in these mediums, you can mask it, you can tokenize it, you can hash it, all of these are possible. The only key principle is that if an attacker intercepts the communication, the data are useless. So, plain text data should never ever ever be stored, and I don't just mean digital, this can be on paper, look, it can be something as innocent as one employee noting down a full card number on paper or having it in an Excel file, this is enough to immediately fail this requirement. Again, this is why we have that sub-requirement of documenting and enforcing these procedures for every single personnel member. 3.5 is about having procedures for encryption key protection. Here's the thing, you may have the strongest encryption on earth for your database, but if the attacker accesses your keys, you're done they get the keys to the kingdom. So besides protecting the data, you have to protect the keys that protect the data. So this includes documenting your key policy, access control to keys, key backups, and more. Also, you should have a policy of storing the keys in the fewest possible places and accessed by the fewest possible people. You're probably noticing that this is a recurring topic, right? Deny everything by default, and give the least amount of access. It's similar to what we did in requirement two, where we minimize the running services or the ports or the apps. Same here, minimize the places where keys are. Every place where the keys are must have a reason. 
So for example, if you have the keys in two places and you say that you don't want to minimize it because it's for security, for example, disaster recovery reasons, that's fair. As long as you have a reason for that number, then 3.6 is about having procedures for encryption key management. So key storage, rotation, transmission, and others. If the previous point was about protecting the keys, this point is about managing them. So first, safe storage and distribution of all keys. That's a must, both physical and digital. Then you should have best practice protocols for defining the crypto period and for how to deal with expired keys, weakened keys, or compromised keys. Because any and all of these may trigger replacement protocols. You can also have split knowledge and dual protocols to minimize damage in case one person is compromised. So you always need two different people, which minimizes vulnerabilities. And finally, 3.7 is our old friend, the usual document and enforce policies and procedures sub-requirement. As with previous requirements, this is just about making sure that employees are aware of these policies and actually put them to work. How keys are stored, how keys are replaced, how to mask personal account numbers, and so on. What are some examples? The first is an unexpected way in which you can fail compliance, and it is if you have clients that send you, for example, via email, their personal account numbers. Even worse, if they also send you their sensitive authentication data. It may not be your fault, but you immediately fail PCI DSS. You need a process to prevent your clients from doing this as well. Naturally, this is an edge case, but it does happen. Remember, if full credit card data in plain text arrives at your system, you fail. It doesn't matter where it came from. Then, there are security sub-requirements for both the data and the keys. They're kind of mirrored. If you think about it, all sub-requirements up to 3.4 are about securing the data itself. Then all requirements from 3.5 onwards are about securing the keys themselves. So you have to protect the data and protect the keys. And finally, having a strong reason is a common pattern. This is a pattern that will come up frequently in other requirements. The criteria used to define the crypto period, to manage the keys, and other procedures doesn't need to have specific values. It just needs to have a reason, common sense, so that you can show the assessor that you've actually thought about this beforehand. If you say that your crypto period is two months because it matches the replacement of a certain technology or the timing of your purging processes, that's a good reason. If you say that it's two months just because, you fail compliance. So again, have a good reason. What are our key takeaways here? The first is about protecting cardholder data. It's what this requirement is about. Protect these data in storage, as well as the keys that are used for its encryption. Sub-requirement 3.1 is about limiting storage. Data retention policies explicitly show where cardholder data are stored, for how long, and why, and show that it's properly purged through some mechanism, physically or digitally, and naturally don't store the data that you don't need. 3.2 is very simple. Don't store sensitive authentication data, period. Pin, chip, magnetic track are all off the table. You also have to show every single point where you could store it and show that you don't store it. 3.3 and 3.4 are the following. 3.3 is about masking the data in all mediums that it's stored in. Paper, Excel, database, emails, others. 3.4 is about not letting it be readable when they're sent in plain text. If you have receipts, logs, or others, at least make sure to mask the data so that it can be readable if someone intercepts it. 3.5 is about protecting keys, while 3.6 is about managing them. So 3.5 is about minimizing the places where keys are stored, backing them up, and minimizing the amount of people 
that have access to them. 3.6 is about your practices in terms of managing the keys. Life cycle, crypto period, key replacement, dual knowledge, and so on. And finally, 3.7 is our old friend, document and enforce. So all of these sub-requirements that come before cannot be done informally. There must be procedures and policies that are known and enforced by employees. So as we see, requirement number three really is about the safe storing of cardholder data with strong encryption and knowing how to manage the keys. But it goes beyond it. Minimizing the storing of data or eliminating it in the case of sensitive authentication data, purging data that you don't need anymore, masking the data that is shown, data backups, and more.